Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jonathan Fisher. Today's fast-changing business development space has become so multifaceted and seemingly complex, many business development professionals are finding it difficult to remain efficient on the most important platform on the world for B2B sales. That's LinkedIn. Well, today's guest can help us with that. Alex Boyd is a serial entrepreneur who most recently founded Revenue Zen, a B2B services firm helping marketers grow their companies through both paid and organic means. Alex brings a specialist's unique insight into creating B2B pipeline and winning new logos from every possible angle. And today he's going to share exactly how you or your team can crush your LinkedIn lead generation in just a few minutes per day. Alex, what a pleasure to have you on the show with us. Welcome. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Happy to be here. So just before we get into the topic of the day, would you tell us a little bit more how you arrived at the insights you're going to share with the listener? Um, by accident. So when I left my last job before starting Revenue Zen and Aware and the current companies that I, I co-founded, I was the head of growth and sales at a growing software company that also had 10 AEs and 10 SDRs. And so when I left, I was still a young professional early in my career and decided to start sharing my learnings on modern sales pros, other forums, and on LinkedIn. And what I was trying to do was just test my ideas. I wanted to know if they were any good. I wanted to know if the people thought what I had learned and developed at my company was um, worthwhile to them too. So I started posting. Um, and when we started getting people saying, I've been reading your post, I, you appeared in my newsfeed, I wanted to reach out. I saw the revenue stacking up and I thought, oh, this is, this is a strategy. There's, there's more to this that I can structure. So I discovered all this really over the course of the last six years when LinkedIn has really become more popular um, and have coalesced what initially started as just an organic effort to journal in public uh, became more of a structured strategy that I realized I was doing something intentionally and it was really working well. So here we are and I'm looking forward to sharing everything that I've learned and developed with everyone else on the show. Well, I love it. And to further set it up, I mean, there are many angles to business development and you actually work in all of those angles, whether it's paid advertising, whether it's organic search result based lead generation, demand gen, all of that. How important would you say LinkedIn outreach really is? Is it becoming so crowded it's losing relevance or what would you say to that? I think that LinkedIn outreach alone has lost a lot of relevance as, uh, already. If it's just LinkedIn outreach paired with nothing else, the response rate's not going to be very good and you're not going to have a lot of success merely setting up automated campaigns. Um, so this is really where the, the closeness of marketing and sales or really just product and sales, just a, a different department apart from just the prospecting team has to come into play, whether that's a combination of uh, outreach from the founder's profile as well as the sales team, whether it's really well designing the sales team's LinkedIn profiles, uh, designing and publishing good collateral, landing pages linked to in your LinkedIn messages, content from the person who's doing the outreach on their profile so that it really makes the profile more just believable, credible before you send somebody a connect request down to the act of tracking all of your metrics in CRM, which most people don't do, but is incredibly important to any sales effort. All these things have to work together. So I think the problem is, I'm gonna kind of skew your question a little bit. Uh, a lot of people think that LinkedIn outreach is by itself a perfectly fine answer. And the problem with that is it's gotta be combined with the rest of your go-to-market strategy. It's just one tactic and it's getting kind of overused. So like any outreach, it's not done, it's not dead, it's never gonna be dead. Um, but you have to pair it with more and more because buyers skepticism filters, their thresholds for what they're gonna believe are really high. So the bar for what you're doing also has to go higher than that as well. Um, and that's really where the, the marketing and sales alignment, we talked about this phrase a lot, but it doesn't get executed. It gets talked about more than it gets actually done. So mm -hmm. that's really where uh, I see LinkedIn outreach efforts and LinkedIn social selling efforts in general succeed or fail. Hmm. Well, and that's, that's often a good thing to look at. What are some of the key areas where companies are missing the mark? So you, you already alluded to one, there's a lack of integration, uh, maybe across the board between the different facets of their business development efforts, certainly between marketing and sales, they're often siloed off and separate from each other. And yeah, they talk and yeah, they hopefully they play nice, but that's not the same thing as being integrated. Maybe you could flesh that out even further and share other ways that you see companies missing it when it comes to their outreach. 
Yes. Um, one of the biggest ones is sending generic outreach. And honestly, you can send templated outreach. I've seen it work okay. But if you're sending it to the wrong person, if you're sending it with copywriting that's less than stellar, but most importantly, if you're just sending the wrong offer to too many of the wrong people, you're burning too much of that market share. Um, one of the things about LinkedIn is you're limited into how much raw outreach you can do. Kind of like with only a certain amount of outreach you can do per each email inbox, it's similar with LinkedIn. So you got to maximize that valuable real estate. And I'm actually not a, um, a devotee of personalization for the sake of personalization. Um, what you have to do more than anything is be relevant. I've bought tons of stuff as a company owner from cold outreach. I've spent uh, five figures per month on vendors that reached out to us cold. But the thing that they got right was they had a very relevant offer and the offer didn't contain anything extraneous. And it was just, it was poetry, not prose. It was extremely well-targeted. It came from somebody I saw as credible and the offer was exactly what I needed. So that's really the fundamentals of it is you have to be in the right place with the right product at the right time and just do your best at that. That is more important than, you know, go Colgate Raiders. I saw you went to school in upstate New York. By the way, here's this software I like to sell you. That doesn't actually add anything. So the, the core of it, the first principle, the first marketing principle we have to look at that bleeds into the sales effort is just the relevance of your offer to the right person at the right time. And that comes down to honestly just laziness or effort in the list building, the setup, and the understanding of the persona process. Um, so one example of this is not targeting your titles, right? So you have, um, you want to go after product titles, but then you include product marketing titles and it's totally different of a role, right? Even product growth versus product analytics, totally different roles. So um, that, that hyper diligence in exactly who you're reaching out to and then making sure you have the industry knowledge to justify why you're reaching out, yeah, that's where it starts. Um, there's a bunch of other tactics and tips I can give, but that's where it has to come down to at the end of the day. If you get that right, you'll get a lot of other things right too. Well, and there's a lot of the efforts out there that you see that still try to go old school. Hey, how, how you doing? I still get calls on my phone if I make the mistake of picking up. Hey, how you doing today? And they'll maybe not even say my name right. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of easy mistakes, low-hanging fruit to pick on companies. But even companies that are doing other things well, I, I think there's a real nugget you mentioned there, which is they didn't try to overdo it. It was very targeted. And the relevance of their effort was more important than how personalized it was. Is that yeah. fair? Absolutely. I think relevance beats personalization any day. So let's talk a little bit about the coordination piece because you, you've really come – you kind of come into the conversation with that as a very heavy thing. But before we do that, I want to remind the live audience, one of the great things about doing this live here on LinkedIn is you get to ask your questions and get them answered right here with our guest. So go ahead and don't wait. Put your questions in the chat, and we're going to bank those for the end of our half hour here together and circle back with Alex and get you some additional insights that way. So when it comes to integrating and kind of defeating this, it, it's pretty pretty baked in in a lot of folks that have been in business for a while that, you know, marketing is marketing, sales is sales, even though we talk about it, like you said, I think acting on is very different. Going from abstract to concrete on that, could you help us with that? What are some tips uh, that can help us make some headway on that? Yeah, good question. I think that if you are a sales leader or you're a rep that wants to ask your sales leader for help in this, and you're talking about LinkedIn, one of the best ways to make your outreach better is actually to like seed the ground with more content and more good brand impressions before you, you actually reach out. So the first thing I look at when we're helping a company improve their outreach is actually not outreach. It's what else you did around that. Um, think about it this way. If somebody from a brand you've heard of a lot of times reaches out, their message can be weaker than normal and I'm still going to respond because I have that built up familiarity and impression from them. Um, so don't forget this evolutionary concept that if we are familiar with something, we're more likely to be less skeptical of it. Um, if I have seen that other caveman before, I'm not going to be as freaked out. It's the same thing with this. If I have seen your, your VPs or your CEO, especially posting on LinkedIn, I'm far more likely to respond to your outreach. So that's a big key for when we talk about sales and marketing integration, it's 
the CEO or a really good CRO is the person to tie those two things together. So here's an example, right? One of the most, uh, the best programs for LinkedIn outreach is a combination of the CEO leads with a strategic narrative, meaning what's the story we're telling to the market about why this solution at this time for who, which people. And the CEO is posting about that at least weekly, customer stories, thought leadership, uh, concepts, how to's, tips, carousels, whatever it is, right? Maybe it's produced in house with an agency like ours, doesn't really matter. But the, the purpose is people have seen that face, name, company brand, and then a lot of good stuff happens. So one of two things can happen. One, you can have all the people who engage with the executive team of the content logged in CRM, which provides a really good call list and outreach list for the sales team. You don't have to mention, hey, I saw you saw this person's post because that can feel a little bit invasive, but you can just use it as an indication they're much warmer. The second concept is just if you're reaching out to people in general, but the marketing and executive team has done a good job of seeding that ground, the sales outreach will become more effective if it's the same. So same list, same messaging, same everything, but marketing has done a good job in advance, you're going to have a better time as a seller. Um, so when we talk about integration, that's a very specific thing you can do is uh, as the CEO is to help be the bridge between sales and marketing. So you can, as the, the owner or founder or CEO, tie those two departments together with good strategic narrative, which lets the sales team participate in that. They can reference somebody else's content without themselves having to be the expert. Now, if you're a seller thinking, well, that's not good enough. I want to take more onto my own, my own plate, then great. So my advice to you as the seller, if you're not getting buy-in for that type of effort at your company, is to do it yourself. Um, when I was at my last job, when I was a seller, I would count how many times prospects asked me if I was one of the founders. This was before LinkedIn was, was super common. Um, they would ask me, oh, so are you one of the founders? And I would say, no, but that's the second time somebody asked me this month. That means I'm doing a good job. And the reason that happened is because I was really curious about the solution, about who it helped, about why it helped them, about how they felt when they had that solution. This was a small business accounting and tax solution. So I dug into that and it meant that I didn't need somebody else's thought leadership quite so much. I could lead with that myself. So if you're leading with a good position, right? Not a pitch, but an actual understanding, like a real knowledge, which you only can get by being curious, then you're less dependent on that. Ideally, the executive team, the marketing team is also seeding the ground in advance. So sales can kind of come in and sweep almost. But if you're a seller and you like your company, but you're not getting buy-in from that for the rest of your team, great way to do it is just to say, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get it done myself. Um, so I highly recommend that if you are an ambitious seller to take it upon yourself to say, well, if I was the CEO, how would I message this? And to just listen to your prospects as best you can. You don't have too many customer conversations. Great. Pull call recordings. Do some of your own research. Go on Reddit. You can find the information. It's there. Um, so don't rely, if your sales training is not good enough, go into it yourself, get in the material yourself. Um, so that's what I'd recommend to sellers who are stuck in that position is A, try to do an internal sale to get buy-in for CEO driven through narrative. And if not, well, it's up to you. What do you can do about it? Right. So just take it upon yourself. Right on. Well, I love that advice. A lot of the best voices out there will tell every sales professional, you are a corporation of one. So that definitely rings very true here on our show. Um, so I wonder in light of what you're saying, that's a great segue into the premise, which is that you can crush your LinkedIn lead gen in just a few minutes a day. And I got to be honest, a lot of things you're talking about sound a little, a little bit time involving. So help us out with that. What are some key ways that any business development professional can make a daily commitment that's not too huge and yield very large results? Yes, that's a good question. So a lot of sales are spend a lot of time and don't get much results. So there's, there's a couple of different visions. One is I want to be radically more efficient with my time on LinkedIn. I'm going to spend almost all my time on LinkedIn. I'm going to get amazing results. In which case, that's your, your primary method of business development. I saw Evan Patterson and the, the listeners of this, um, this show. I know for a fact that when he spent all of his time on LinkedIn as an SDR years ago, he was able to set 
60, 70 appointments in a month, at least 40. He spent a lot of time on LinkedIn, but not nearly as many as others in his org spent emailing and calling. Hmm. So that's great. Now, if your primary method of outreach is emails and calls and LinkedIn is something you do on the side, great. Let's talk about optimizing and spending less time and being more efficient. One of the main things you should add to your cadences apart from outreach is commenting. So public outreach is a great way to think about commenting. If you create a list, whether it's in Sales Navigator or in Aware or a bookmarks bar of your top prospects and also the other people that sell to your top prospects and have an audience themselves, comment on all their posts with something more than agreed good post, right? So this tracks back to being curious and understanding the subject matter really well. And once you do that, you can leave good comments that actually show who you are as a human and your understanding of why the solution helps people. If you can do that, adding comments to your sequences, think about just commenting five or 10 comments a day. If you do that, your outreach is gonna be so much more effective. If you go for three public interactions, comments are received or left, and then you direct message somebody, you will need so many fewer actual messages sent to get good quality meetings and ops. Um, now, if you're an SDR setting meeting for somebody else, then you're gonna notice something. The meetings you set from this type of higher quality LinkedIn outreach are gonna be better opportunities. So hopefully you're comped on ops or closed one. If you're only comped on meetings, you might actually lose out a little bit here because you might set fewer meetings that are much better. So our data show that the win rate on opportunities sourced from LinkedIn, from social selling, are converted at a much higher rate than almost anything else. Double cold outbound that didn't involve this type of, you know, preceded commenting first, helping people publicly form of outreach. So be prepared for a higher quality pipeline, not necessarily a greater quantity of meetings, but they'll be better. And those 10 comments a day shouldn't take you more than 10 minutes. Uh, the reason we founded Aware, one of my companies, is to make that time required to leave 10 or 20 comments a day, 10 minutes a day. Whereas normally that would take you an hour and a half to do if you're just scrolling through the feed. So whether you, it takes you a bit longer, a bit less, introduce commenting into your workflow and you'll be far more efficient than only doing private one-to-one -one outreach. You wanna be seen helping other prospects because that'll build a lot of trust when you reach out to somebody else. They'll have, they'll have seen before you commented on that other guy's post and that was insightful and that'll be lodged in their subconscious. When you reach out to them, that's gonna be another brand impression you made. They'll have seen your face, your name, your company, and it'll be a much easier conversation to start. That's a great tip because it integrates well with what you had said previously about making yourself an expert, like taking ownership on being super well-educated on your solution, on the problems that your solution solves for the end user and so forth, so that you're not just randomly commenting and trying to be friendly this isn't about being affable. This is about really bringing value to the marketplace. If I'm hearing you correctly, would you agree with that? Yes, you hit the nail on the head. It, you, it's much better to be respected and trusted and known as somebody insightful than it is to be liked. You don't want to be an asshole, but it's better to be thoughtful than to be liked. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the problems with this is people will default to writing comments like, I totally agree, this rocks, that's awesome, great post which just makes you sound like an energetic bunny rabbit, not somebody I'm going to spend tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars with. Mm -hmm. So be somebody that I can spend a lot of money with, right? And what does that entail? Um, you're going to have to be talking about an expensive problem. So we're not talking about sending more emails. Uh, we're talking about restructuring your sales team. We're talking about the, the, the future of the company, right? So take one tip for that is when you're thinking about what to comment with, Take the problem that you're going to talk about. I'll take the thing you're going to comment, relate it back to the problem and what that problem means. If you talk about what the problem you're solving means, and that's just an undercurrent of all your comments, you're going to, you're going to as I call it, talk about an expensive problem, which makes you much more trusted and much more likely for those comments to result in revenue. As you said, it's not about being affable. It's about being credible. Hmm. I like that. Is, is, are there some best practices on some of the, the nuts and bolts here? I mean, can you wax a little bit too verbose? Do you have a rule of thumb? Keep it to a paragraph or so? What would you say about that part? That's a good question. I've seen some good comments that are very short. Um, it's less about the length and more about 
adequately addressing the topic authentically. Mm. The word authentically is thrown around a lot, but if you have a real reaction that just takes longer to explain, take two paragraphs. Um, if you're writing two paragraphs to say something very brief, that's weird. Um, I, without doing an example, it's hard to, it's hard to um, give you one, but if um, uh, it has to be a reasonable conversation, I think about any other conversation you might have, not on LinkedIn, just in real life. Um, would you, would your response be considered droning on and boring or would it be considered appropriately concise? Um, that just depends on what the topic is, but um, think of LinkedIn as your, your virtual conference, your virtual coffee shop with your buyers in it. Um, that's where just the social skills part of social selling comes into play. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. In one of my previous guests, we talked about how uh, social skills themselves have become, uh, well, let's just say negatively impacted by us all being locked in for a couple of years. Uh, so maybe that's a sidebar skill area to, to focus on here. Absolutely. Um, also, if you don't know whether you're being too verbose or not, maybe it's time to get dirt honest and ask some friends that would be, be honest with you to let you know. Uh, so that, that is definitely a great couple of, of tips here. Make yourself valuable to your marketplace, very pragmatic. What are some additional ways that, again, small commitment of time, I can get some great results on my LinkedIn prospecting? Post and also comment and talk about customer stories, hmm. um, specifically stories of how other customers were successful. And this is another way where if you're a seller, you're going to have to really take an honest look at your company's glossy website case studies and ask yourself if you really understand them, mm -hmm. right? So, all right, here's this case study of how this company was able to reduce their inventory on hand from $4 million of inventory to 1.5. Okay, take a moment. Do you actually understand how the software you are selling accomplished that? Was it the software? Was it how the software impacted their team? Was it their ability to staff um, the same amount of supply chain managers with um, an extra tech, but no increase in hiring? That's how they able to reduce inventory. You, you really have to like, get in there and be able to talk about the successes your other customers have had. Mm -hmm. That one thing will shortcut a bunch of stuff. You'll, you'll open so many doors by being able to speak to how other people have solved this one most burning problem that other buyers in the space have, right? So maybe for supply chain, that's one of them, right? It's being able to have just the right amount of inventory on hand and, and less inventory in your stock. So you're not holding too much, but also you're not running out of supply. Um, so you have to be able to, to no bullshit explain how your solution does that. You brought up another good point earlier, which is find somebody friendly who is willing to tell you the real truth. I have a buddy of mine from high school who is a senior cloud cost optimization engineer at uh, Square. Hmm. Guess what I do when we're selling cloud cost optimization software? Hmm. Hey, Eric, does this sound like sales bullshit to you? And he'd be like, that part is, that part's good. And I'd be like, well, that's convenient. I don't have to actually. And then I might ask him, you know, yeah. okay, explain to me like I'm five. What part of that makes this a good thing, right? What part of that makes that fluffy? And I ask others who are experts to poke and prod up my, my stuff until I can refine my own knowledge. Yeah. Um, and then I leave with just those little sound bites, customer stories, um, bite size, one sentence, customer story. That's a huge way to be efficient. You don't have to beat around the bush and talk about features and benefits. You can just lead with not some ROI step, but like the one sentence they did that got around this and got to there. How are you approaching this? Oh man, yeah. it hits people a ton of bricks and they just want to know how it works. Yeah, right on. A couple of things that, that strike me here is that that's another opportunity perhaps for better integration. Because um, while we have to be concise in telling the most important nuggets of a case study, it's good to know the long form. Maybe you can add a little extra color when you're in conversation. I've experienced this where it piques their interest. If you're able to say, well, you don't know the, 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 the best part and you can share a little bit more, uh, is that maybe that's something that there should be more internal conversation about inside companies? Would you agree? Yes. Um, so a lot of companies, there's only a couple people who, who know the real good stuff, right? There's only a couple of subject matter experts and everyone else is just sort of pitching the pitch. I noticed this a lot. There's not a lot of distribution and clarification of a subject matter expertise. Um, and if you're in sales, you can kind of save a rattle for more of that to be done. And that can be helpful. Um, and it's a good clarification exercise for the whole company. Um, so in long form, do you mean more like posting content 
Or do you mean more like when you're in a customer conversation? Yeah, like so that I, I know what it is so that if I'm talking to that prospect, I could actually share a little, some additional yeah. insights on it. Like it's really, it really is part of our, our story, almost like a tribal thing, right? Where I really know our story very well. Yep. Okay, good point. So a couple things. Um, one, if you are the seller, so you don't need to pass the appointment off to somebody else, then um, I would just not worry about the meeting. I actually don't, I'm not a big meetings person. Um, I'd rather just, move prospect brains forward towards buying from us. Mm. Um, that doesn't have to require a Zoom call. I've done tons of that with like a well-written two paragraph DM, a, a voice note, right? So somebody, somebody reaches out and says, hey, we're thinking of doing this. We don't know if we should hire this type of person, but um, how would you approach X, Y, and Z? I pick up my phone and I go, all right, good question. Um, I only have 60 seconds to explain this, but here's what I would think about. And I leave the rest of the voice note. And if it just doesn't make sense and we're trading too many voice notes, I'm like, well, okay. So, I mean, do you have, I'm running out of time. I'm running to something, but do you have time for a zoom next week? I can go over it more. Um, a similar principle applies if you are the BDR and you need to pass this off to somebody else. So um, I really want in those cases to, you have to have a little bit of depth, but you don't have to have a ton of breadth. So um, if you're a BDR, memorize one or two good stories in some depth. You don't have to be an expert, just literally memorize a good amount of expertise in one or two cases, All right? So maybe it's a better understanding you can spit out at any given time of one customer story, right? How did that one customer realize those results again in that no bullshit type of way? So then you can bring that up, you can really tell it. And if somebody keeps peppering you with questions on it, you can say this really good questions. Like, I don't know if we have time or if it makes sense to go through all of those in writing. Um, you know, hey, no pressure, but uh, the um, uh, my team or whatever person's name um, will be able to go into more of these stories for you um, and talk about whether it makes sense. So I really like the, um, I know your quota if your BDR is based on meetings, the more you can pretend like it's not, the better you're going to do. Um, <laughs> I've noticed that the, the people who, there's an asynchronicity, right? Uh, the people who, whose time you want, they don't want more meetings. Executives want fewer meetings. Mm -hmm. So you really have to be in, this, in the same boat as them where you're both just like, yeah, I mean, do we have to have a meeting? If it makes sense, then yes, but um, let's avoid calendar clutter, right? Um, you can even say that. Like, like, look, I don't know if it makes sense to add more clutter to each of our calendars, but um, I think it would make just be a better discussion to do a, a Zoom that's not terribly lengthy next week or the week after. I often just say like in the in the weeks or months to come, I love that. Would you make sense to meet this quarter or next? Pfft. That's the best way to get somebody to meet with you next week is to say, let's meet this quarter or next. Yeah. Um, so memorize a little bit of deep subject expertise. Hmm. Don't worry about breath, just get one or two stories really, really down, be able to tell those, and then casually allude to more knowledge being available if they do that you know, no pressure Zoom call that's the best way to create high quality opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you just pretend like they want meetings as much as you do, they're gonna mistrust all that valuable subject matter expertise that you so time consumingly gained and spat out on that brief cold call or DM or whatever it is. Yeah, I like that. You're subliminally creating a fear of loss when you say this quarter, they're, they're, they're afraid the ball might get dropped. That's I like that. Yeah. Well. I mean, it's been a great conversation. I can't believe how quickly it's blown past Alex. I do say it a lot, but not quite as much as I'm saying it right now. That was a very fast paced conversation. I love it. Um, how can users take next steps? We're talking about taking action on LinkedIn every day. You, you have a pretty cool platform that can help the listener do that, correct? Yes. So a couple of things, if you are on the sales side and you're looking for a way to be better, faster, stronger at all of these things, more efficient at commenting, aware is a great platform to download. Um, managers and teams can download it and track their reps, links, and activity. So not just connection requests and messages, but comments left, comments received, and get a holistic view as a sales manager of what is my team doing on LinkedIn. Um, founders can also reach out to our agency. We do strategic narrative work. Um, we do ghostwriting for CEOs, but um, the average seller or sales manager or sales leader, grab a free trial of AWARE, and it's going to make your LinkedIn activity all the better and make it easier to focus on this good stuff versus spending all that time you could have spent getting expertise on things like list building and, and scrolling through LinkedIn and getting distracted and looking at ads. So um, that's a great place. If you want to just chat with me first and figure out where to go or have more questions, my LinkedIn profile is a great way to do that too. Love it. 
All right. Well, very good. Well, we are going to go ahead and veer over to Q&A with our live audience. And now is the time. If you haven't posted yet, uh, go ahead and do that at this point. We will pick a few here. I go, I'll go through. I feel like uh, it's some sort of a show, and I'm going to pick the winner here. Uh, so um, this is a good question from Joshua Bailey. So do you think – how do you feel about, like, the company page? You talked about integration with the, you know, the, the seller, him or herself. Yep. Is that a place where just like content should live? Maybe not necessarily promoting, like talk, talk a little bit about how those should integrate, I guess. Maybe let's keep, leave it open-ended. Yeah. Um, so a couple of good answers. So one is content and the second is community involvement. So on the content side, the most typical company paid strategy is reposting company blogs, which sucks. Doesn't, doesn't do anything at all. Um, you might get a few more clicks, but you're just going to drone on with, here's this new blog post, hashtags. Here's those other new blog posts, hashtags. Um, then there's a second level, which is more about uh, team advocacy, which you allude to, Josh, when you comment. I like that. That doesn't make sense. So, so team advocacy, screenshot of your team on Zoom, uh, you get together at the company party, all wonderful things. Um, the best company pages act more like people. So if the, the CEO can create that leadership, but so can the company. You could even go straight for the CEO and just post that on the company's account and say we instead of I. That's a perfectly valid strategy. Um, you can then take that forward and the company can actually, whether by hand or using aware, comment on posts. So the company's page can itself efficiently leave good comments on other people's posts, prospects posts, influencers posts, whichever. Um, and there's this cool role, which is the community manager, which is sparking up, which is it's kind of a tie between sales and marketing because a community manager through their own profile and the company page will really flesh out the voice of the company. It'll give it more richness because think about Chili Peppers social, Gong social. They're great. They have their own voice, right? Wendy's Twitter has a great example of a company having its own voice. Um, but not that Gong is, is the equivalent of that, but um, if the company has its own voice and is interacting a lot, that can help a ton with sales kind of being part of that. So it's less of just this random solo sales rep reaching out with no support. It's the sales rep in the company of its team, its leadership, its company page. It just looks a lot better from a buyer perspective. If this isn't just some solo sales rep, it's, it's a team effort that's intentionally made to bring me a specific message. I can really evaluate it on my own time through a number of different angles. So the two takeaways there are um, use the company page actively for commenting and outreach. And then two, if you're going to post company blogs and just repost them on social, just don't do it at all. Um, write real things, original thought process on the company page um, and then do outreach. And then sales has something they can kind of latch onto. Like it's more like a beacon for sales than this microphone to distribute blogs. Yeah, I like that a lot. So I, I didn't really thought about that. Have it act like a real person. That's good stuff. Here's a question from Irina. Irina, and I'm not going to try to say your last name. Uh, Alex, can you share some success stories of startups that have, have effectively utilized LinkedIn for lead gen during their go-to-market phase? It is tougher then. You don't have the momentum. Uh, maybe give us some tips on that if you would. Yeah, I mean, um, first one that comes to mind is mine. Um, I started posting on LinkedIn and 2017, and we, uh, after the first few months, have been averaging 60, 65K a month of revenue from LinkedIn consistently that whole time. Um, and for the first few years, I posted one to maybe two times a week. Recently, I've been posting a little bit more often, almost twice a week. Um, but that's one. I talked about an expensive problem, um, which is executive growth strategy, social selling, SEO. Um, and we've brought in 135, closed one from that, I think. Um, so definitely lead generation and also customer generation. Um, there are plenty of others. I mean, think about Lavender, right? Lavender is a sales tool that helps you write better emails. Um, their social has been a huge, huge driver of lead gen. And I didn't know about Lavender a couple of years ago. And now everyone has. So that's a great example as well. And you, you see them doing this in action. You see them doing really creative things on social. They're not just sharing blogs. You, you wouldn't catch them dead saying, here's this new blog post, Pfft, hashtags done. Um, the people, the founders and the staff are all posting their own voice. It's all in, in a way that ties back 
to what they're doing, right? Which is helping you communicate better and more efficiently. Mm. Um, nor are they joining on. Um, Gong's a great example, right? There's law firms that have done this. I mean, there's a lawyer in Florida that, that has brought in, I don't know how many millions of dollars from posting just absolutely aggressive, wonderful, thoughtful stories about his tough upbringing and all the people he's taken to court. So it's not just sales tech that does this. You can, you can do it as, as any vertical, um, but there's, there's tons of success stories of startups. Um, it's the ones that are brave, bold, and insightful that will succeed with this. The ones that are bland, boring, and, and want to remain conservative with their viewpoints, they will fail and it'll be a waste of time. They may as well not do it at all. So um, that's, I think, what unites the success stories in that early stage go-to-market phase um, because it's almost particularly effective in that phase. Once you're bigger, you're probably going to have a lot of decision by committee and not a lot of political ability within your company to be more bold in the way that it requires. So uh, it's especially effective during the initial go-to-market phase versus the later stage go-to-market phase. I like that. I, I can guess your answer from what you just said. Would you agree a lot of companies are, are overly protective of their brand on, on this term? Like maybe they should maybe democratize their outreach a lot more than they have so far. Yeah, I think they're afraid of their brand being too organic when that's exactly what a brand should be. Um, people don't connect with the, something bland and boring. I mean, unless you want to be Sears. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's not, not the best story at the moment, is it? No, oh, it's not. <laughs> too many B2B brands want to essentially be Sears, which is terrible. Yeah. Um, you, you have to stand out. As, as scary as that might be, you will only have alpha, the finance term for performance above the, the baseline. You only have social media alpha by um, standing out, hmm. by definition. Good stuff. Here's a question from Levy Popak, who's asking, would you encourage leadership to provide the list of closed or lost leads for sellers to go after specifically on LinkedIn? Like, would that work well? And if so, can you provide a good model for that type of outreach? Definitely. Um, I would almost, this, this should be the first thing you do. Um, if, if there are closed loss leads to go after, I would approach those first before doing any cold outreach. Um, when I was leading a sales team at my last company, I was um, primarily starting people on uh, on those leads. And what I would do is I would have a report um, in Salesforce of last activity is greater than X number of days. I would adjust it based on how aggressive we need the pipeline, maybe 90 days, maybe 120 days. And then the opportunity status was closed lost and there was no closed opportunities on that account. And this list would just auto-populate as an account went without activity and was closed lost for a certain amount of time, it would pop up. So then you can be pinged to go after them on LinkedIn. Um, and you could do this with Aware. You can take all of those leads and just bulk upload them into Aware. And then you have a list for if any of these leads ever writes a post, I'm going to see it. I'm going to leave a comment on it. And if you're commenting on all the posts of your closed lost, they're going to think of you when they need that solution for the first time. Um, so staying top of mind is a great use for LinkedIn and you'll have a ton of, you know, people call them crawlbacks sometimes, right? They, they didn't buy from us two years ago and then they came back, um, and finally want to buy at full price two years later, because we stayed top of mind. We were consistent. We were there. And that just provides that extra edge of sales results. Um, so close last lead should be the, the absolute first list you go after before doing any, um, any net new cold except maybe one exception, which is um, the customers whose champions change jobs and are now a good fit somebody else. That's the only better lead source, I would say, is um, customer alumni. But second to that is closed loft leads and Salesforce or CRM or any TRM is, can be a great tool to do that. Um, I'm typically a Salesforce junkie, so I typically build it in that platform. Hmm. Understood. You're not the only one. Here's a question from Sruti Patel, um, and this kind of gets to some tactical sort of the maybe the maybe the bottom end of what we've been talking about here today. So once you're trying to actually go in and get an appointment, can you give some best practices? She's asking if you have a CRM is contacting clients, how often do you call them or email them to book an appointment, and how long do you keep after? I, I'm assuming she's she says how long do you keep them? I assume she means how long do you keep on? So yeah. when it comes to cadence, you know, there, there's I hear a lot of different opinions on this front. What what would you how would you weigh in? <clears throat> Um, the way I think about it is not as if there's 
a defined period of time, I think there's some wisdom that is no longer wisdom. The, the wisdom used to be, you need to contact somebody this many times before you give up on them. Um, in a world where sales used to be just, if you called them more than once, they would pick up and you'd have a better chance of talking to them. That was great. But, um, the problem with what we're seeing now is people are very used to that. If they don't have a problem that you can help them solve, they're just not going to respond. Mm -hmm. So you saying, well, I'm going to give them one month or two months to reach out back to me and respond to my email before I stop calling them. It's just so self-centered, right? We, they, you have no idea what their priorities are um, in most cases, right? Sometimes you can see, you can infer, but um, they know what their priorities are. So you're much better off being respectfully top of mind. And if they're not interested now, there's, don't break up with them. Don't send them a last attempt to contact you email. Um, just remain respectfully top of mind so that they know who to call when they do have that problem. And you have not just annoyed them so much that they don't want to contact you when they do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's more about just consistently nurturing the entire base of your prospects. Um, LinkedIn is a great way to do that because you can have, um, you can again use the lists and aware. And whenever one of these prospects writes a post or comments on a post, that's a cue to just engage with them publicly. Not in a high pressure way, just you're just being there. You're being thoughtful, you're being there, you're demonstrating your credibility, you're highlighting your customer results. And if you've asked them a month ago if they want to take a meeting and the answer was no, you don't need to ask them again. Um, and it should be whatever makes sense. So if they, um, Let's say you talked to them three months ago and they weren't ready to have a meeting with you and not, not, a, not a priority for us. And then three months later, they comment on a post saying something that implies we've now been struggling with this. You might reach out and say, um, hey, about a quarter ago, we talked and this wasn't an issue. Um, I happened to see this post in my feed when, when you said this. Um, no worries if things are still the same, but if it does make sense to resume our conversation now, Given that, happy to do so, all right? That's a very relevant way of staying on top of, of not yet booked appointments, using LinkedIn, using that kind of clever next generation outreach with commenting publicly leading to private engagement um, to warm people up. So don't send the breakup email. If you do that, then you seem weird if you comment on their posts three months later. Didn't you break up with me? All right, so <laughs> avoid the breakup email. Don't do that. Like you're really not breaking up with them. Um, and avoid the, the fake scarcity, right? Mm. There's, no, there's no scarcity anymore. People know that you have data tools. They, they know that you're going to follow up with them. They know you, that you have, if you sell software, there's no capacity issue. You can, they can buy the software whenever they're damn well ready. Um, so don't break up. Just stay top of mind. Well, I love it. Well, a wealth of great insights today, Alex Boyd. I want to thank you for adding so much value to our audience here on Evolve Sales Leader. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Yeah, right on. You're welcome back anytime. Thanks. Well, and thank you to our fantastic audience. It's wonderful to have such a, a growing show and such a great participation. Uh, continue to spread the word, would you? Tell folks that you know that want to learn more about how they can better sell, particularly B2B, and uh, bring them back. We're going to be right here at the same time, same station next time. By the way, if you do enjoy the content and want to check out some of our previous guests, Wherever you like to get podcasts, we are known as the Evolve Sales Leader. Surprise, surprise. And we are very happy to have as our powering sponsor, Overpass. They're one of the leading solutions for getting talent that can help you on customer service. They can help you on lead gen, business development representatives. Whatever you need to grow your company quickly, you can hire people in days instead of weeks in an amazingly cost-effective manner. So check it out. It's free to open up your account at overpass.com. That's going to do it for today. Jonathan Fisher signing off. Thanks again for being here, everybody. We'll see you next time.